So um, in terms of the kind of truth table, uh, the, the important point is to note that the up, to update a cell, I mean, in, in our mind we're thinking about moving cars, but we're not, in the cellular automaton model, you're not moving cars, you've got formal update rules. But the, the, the value of a cell depends on its, its nearest neighbors. You need to know, in general, who's behind you and who's ahead of you. If you're empty, you need to know who's behind you so you know whether something moves in. If you're full, you need to know who's ahead of you so you know if you can move forward. Now, because it's quite a simple model, it turns out that you don't always need all the information. So um, if you're full, you don't need to know who's behind you because it doesn't matter. Um, but you can draw this up and then you can draw up these truth. If you, if you, if you find it uh, useful, a useful way of thinking about it, you can throw up these truth tables that if, if, if the road is zero, then, the, the, then um, at the next time, then the road is given by zero if your downstream neighbor is zero and one if your downstream neighbor is one. That's the case where you're empty and somebody moves in. If you're full, then the, the, the next state is given by um, zero if um, if Sorry, if you are one, then the the value at the next at the next state is given by um, uh, zero. Uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. It depends on um, on on the value ahead of you whether it's it's zero or one. So you move ahead if the guy um, ahead of you is is um, is full or empty. But in terms of code, yeah. Sorry? Yeah. So if R of Ti plus 1 So okay, so I just that's why so if you if you're 1, okay, then if uh fine. If if you're 1, okay, then your next value is 0 if the one ahead of you is empty, okay? So if you're if 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 the the the, um, the point is actually yeah so if you're if you're if you're if your current state is one, then the um the, the the state ahead is zero if the one ahead of you is one is zero and one if the one ahead of you is is one. It doesn't depend on the state of the of the guy to the to behind you. Okay, that makes sense. No, he won't. No, so it's an instantaneous move. So, so you, you go through the cars and you say, can you move? And he can't, so he doesn't move, okay? So they're not moving as a grunt. You, you, it, that car won't move because, because the cell ahead was occupied. Because that's, okay, so I maybe didn't explain the update rules properly. You, you look at it and then it, you decide there whether it can move or not, okay? Uh, you don't look at whether the next one ahead is going to move, okay? So could you think about, the, just in general, the communications, you clearly need to communicate with your neighbors. But can you think of any issues if you use um, synchronous communication, if you effectively phone your neighbor? Okay. Can you think of any issues with that? Okay. What, are there any problems if you decide to do this by phoning? So I decide I need to find out what's happening with my upstream, so I need to phone my neighbor up the way. Okay. So I phone my neighbor up the way. Okay. But will they pick up the phone? No, because they're phoning their neighbor up the way, who's also phoning their neighbor up the way. So if you try and implement this with synchronous communications, you've got a problem, because everybody is trying to phone their neighbor, and nobody's picking up, so you get deadlock, okay? And especially because we have got periodic bounding conditions. Now, if you didn't have periodic bounding conditions, it would work because the guy at the end wouldn't phone his neighbor, and it would all ripple down. That would be inefficient, but it wouldn't deadlock. But in this case, that's why I've chosen periodic boundary conditions. If you try and do this with synchronous communications in the naive sense, which is everybody phones their neighbor, then you have a problem because everybody's phoning and nobody's, nobody's replying. With asynchronous, it's fine. If you post a letter or send an email, it's fine. You just send it off and then you can, you can look the other way. There's a simple way, I wouldn't use it in practice, but at least in principle, of breaking the deadlock with synchronous communication. Can you think about how you would do it? You need to think about more than three people. Think about 100 people or something. You can do it in two phases rather than one phase. And the trick is to have even and odd people. So the even people phone and the odd people pick up, and then you switch the odd people phone and the even people pick up. So you pair up even odd, even odd, even odd, okay? 
So that, that breaks the deadlock, but that's more of a technicality. What I'm going to do to, so when I write pseudocode, there's, it's what, when you write code, you always have issues, issues, you always have consideration with the boundary conditions. So here, the boundaries are updated differently, okay? So this is pseudocode for a serial, this is pseudocode for the serial code, okay? Here, the edge, uh, edges are updated differently because we have periodic boundaries. You can do that in two ways. You can have special code for the edge condition saying, if I'm on the edge, then do something different. Or you can do something else. You can have explicit, um, you'll be familiar with these if you did the intro course, you can have explicit halos. You can have dummy cells. And it, that, that's a sort of an arbitrary choice in the serial code. But in the parallel code, it turns out to be quite critical. So what we're going to do, I don't know if you can all see this, well, no, I'll, I'll illustrate it on the, the actual slide. But we're going to have, although I only have n cells, I'm going to have my arrays all the new are going to go from 0 to n plus 1. I augment them with what we call halo or ghost cells on the end. And what I do is I fill them in with the boundary conditions, okay? So when I look up from cell n, I'm supposed to see cell 1. So I'll take a copy of cell 1 into a cell n plus 1. When I look down from cell 1, I'm supposed to see cell n. So I'll topic, take a copy of cell n and put it in cell 0. And that allows me to run the same code on every cell. Even the guys at the end could just look up, look down, okay? Because I've put these sort of fake boundaries on there. I've copied them. And that's it's an arbitrary choice in the serial code if you were to do that or, um, or, or have special code. But it makes the code very simple. I initialize old of i for whatever I want it to be. I loop over iterations. These are my boundary conditions. I say old of 0 equals old of n. So that means when, when I look down from cell 1, I get cell 0, which has been set to cell n, which is correct. I set old of n plus 1 equals old of 1. So when I look up from n, I get, old, I get cell n plus 1, which is equal to old of 1. So I'm implementing the periodic boundary conditions by explicit copying, which might seem a bit weird, but it will turn out to be very useful. I then loop over i equals 1 to n and do the update. The update is very simple because, as I said, if you're 0, you only care about what's downstream. If you're 1, you only care about what's upstream. So, so the logic's simpler than you might imagine. There aren't the eight cases here you might have imagined. And the important point then is we, then we do a copy back. So I update new as a function of old, then I set old equals new for the new iteration. So this is code to do that cellular automaton update with periodic boundary conditions, where I have implemented the periodic boundary conditions by explicit copying into these ghost or halo cells. And that makes the part, so what we want to do in parallel, in generically, is I would read in the data. So what I could do, sorry, this is, I mean, this is a new slide. What I could do is I could broadcast the, broadcast the data to two processes. Everyone could have all the data, okay? Everyone could just update their local piece of the array, which they're able to do because they know all the data. I could just run the code on the big array. Okay. And then I could globally resynchronize. Re I could basically say, um, I would then have to basically marry these up, okay? This is called a replicated data strategy. This is where you basically, everybody has all the data, every does local, every updates part of it, and then you kind of resynchronize back together again. Um, every process stores the entire state of the calculation. Now, so what you do is you, you replicate, you broadcast the data, but you split up the calculation. This is not an efficient thing to do for two reasons. One is the, um, the, the resynchronization step at the end is, is, is a hassle. We've all, got a, 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 we've all got a copy of the road, which is partially complete. We need to synchronize that. But the main thing is that we're replicating the data, and that simply is crazy. One of the main reasons for using parallel machines is to use their memory. But if you replicate the data everywhere, you're saying, I can't, I've got a terabyte of memory on, on Archer, but I can't run a code that's more than two gigabytes because every process has to have a copy of the entire data set. That's clearly crazy. So the only way you can get calculations to scale is to split the data up. So what you do is you scatter the data at the start. You read the data in and you scatter it out into two pieces of four. Then the internal cells can be updated independently, as I said. You can update the internal cells, but you need communications for the external cells. And at the end of each iteration, you sum the local number of moves. So we then split the calculation between two processes. And each process knows which part of the roadway it's updating. And at each iteration, you'll need some synchronization to make sure that, um, that you're finished. So that's conceptually what we're going to do. In terms of message passing, um, OK, I've said all this in, um, I've said all this in, in words. 
in terms of message passing parallelization, what we're going to do is we're going to take the road and hopefully we want to update it so it gets the right answer, which is that. We take two processes and each process has a halo. So each process, instead of having an array of length 4, has an array of length 6 because it has these ghost cells. And the communication comes in in initializing these ghost cells. This is phoning your neighbor where basically before you do any calculation, the values are copied. So in the serial code, you could just copy the values locally. In the parallel code, you have to do communication. So you initialize the halo data based on uh, the values from other processes. And it's rather simple for two processes, but, but it's more complicated for more. And the important point about this is once you've done that, each process can run the same code. Each process can run the serial code. Okay? All it has to know is instead of n, um, instead of eight cells, it has four. Instead of n cells, it has n over p, where p is the number of processes. So by doing, by having the boundary conditions, the boundaries explicit, it means the serial code is almost identical to the parallel code. You update the boundaries, you update the cells. You update the boundaries, you update the cells. In the serial code, updating the boundaries is a copy, and the parallel code updating the boundaries involves communication. But once you've done that, the code is the same. And I'm trying to illustrate here that if you set the problem up correctly, parallel code doesn't have to be totally different from the serial code. You can separate it to clear communication and calculation phases so that they look very similar. You can see now if I update these, I get I get this um, value. So here, this guy moves, and none of these die. So local moves is two, one. Here, this guy moves, this guy moves, local moves is two. And I need to do global reduction a redu to add them together to get the global number of moves to be three. So, um, sorry, that was slightly rushed. So, but that, so there's, there's, the two concepts here are, one is splitting the data up and doing the communications. And you, you should think about the fact that if you do Synchronous communications, you have a problem, and so you can either break that problem by doing this even-odd pairing, but more elegantly with some kind of asynchronous communication. But secondly, as an implementation, if you add halos, explicit ghost cells, to your arrays, you can write a code where the, where the serial code is almost identical to the parallel code. So if I was to up... So I hate them animations going backwards, it's difficult. The parallel code here, all I would have to say is this line here would be replaced by update the boundaries with some communications. Then this code is identical, except n is no longer n, it's n over 2 or n. It's a smaller number because it only applies to your local cells. Okay? Does that make sense? So uh, the only other thing to note here is that this nicely illustrates, uh, illustrates um, Amdahl's, well, Gustafsson's law for those who are here Monday, Tuesday. Imagine that it takes. Um, two seconds, uh, sorry, it takes half a second to update a cell, okay? So if we look at the parallel calculation, we're going to work out how long it takes, okay? It takes half a second to update a cell. So how many, much time does each process, so in the serial code, how long does it take? It takes half a take, second to update a cell. You've got eight cells, so it takes four seconds. How long does the parallel code take to update the cells? got four at half a second each. So it's two seconds. Each, each, each process, so we've, we've half the time, right? It's twice as fast. Well, it isn't, because we've got to do the communication, okay? How long does the communication take? How long does it take to phone somebody? Okay. Give me a rough answer. Uh, okay, well, we're not updating the halo. So, so the halo does count, but it's only involved in communication. We're only updating the interior, yeah? So how long does it take to communicate the halo? How long does it take to phone somebody and phone them up? Just rough guess. Uh, I'd say 30. Let's say 30 seconds, right? So this serial code takes four seconds, and this parallel code takes how long for an iteration? 32 seconds, right? Not very good, OK? Imagine this was 8,000 cells, yeah? How long would the calculation take for 8,000 cells? 4,000 seconds, an hour, OK? And the calculation here would take 2,000 seconds, right? How long would the communication take in this bigger problem? The problem's 1,000 times bigger. But how long does the communication take? 30 seconds at the same time. Because 
you only have to communicate the exterior cells. You only have to communicate. So you're doing the same thing. You're just, you're just communicating the, the data for one cell. So there, 8,000 seconds becomes 4,030. Well, that's good, yeah? So this shows you that you, know, big, you have to run big problems for parallel computers because the communications overhead will either stay constant or grow as the problem size grows. But if your calculation, of, if your calculation time grows faster than that, which it typically does, um, this is an extreme case. In a 2D problem, you'd be, you'd be calculating over L squared um, cells and communicating for L, okay, the perimeter. So although the communications would grow with data size, it grows slower than the calculation. So you still get this effect, Gustafsson's law, that, that, that in parallel, you have to run large problems to get any speed up. Otherwise, you're killed by the communications. Okay? So that's quite a nice example for that.